All right, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. For our attorneys that are present, uh, this, is, uh, this event is available for uh, CLE credit for one hour. It's been approved by the State Bar. If you wish to receive credit and you didn't attend the Bench and Bar where you received credit already for this event or for this uh, topic, uh, fill, please fill out the uh, evaluation forms. It's on the they're on the table um, right outside by the front door when you leave. And uh, so I can get it to the State Bar so we can get the event um, accredited. Um, for those of you who do not know, my name is Matt Green. I am the president of our local Federalist Society chapter here, the Brevard Hay and Alex Howard oh. chapter. We're very excited tonight to have uh, Judge William Pryor of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals come speak to us tonight on the seminal case of Marbury versus Madison. Uh, for those of you uh, who do not know, the Federalist Society is a nonpartisan, conservative, and um, libertarian organization dedicated to freedom, federalism, and judicial restraint. The Federalist Society seeks to educate the legal community and the, uh, the population in general uh, through its programs and publications about how limited constitutional government based on the rule of law uh, can have a positive effect on law and public policy. Uh, for those of you uh, who are on my email list, I've actually sent you a um, copy of the uh, presentation tonight. The, uh, that was actually, it's a publication that Judge Pryor did that was published by the uh, Engage, which is the uh, official Federalist Society um, publication. And for those of you who are not on the list or who have not gotten the email, get with me afterwards and I'll be more than happy to forge you the, uh, the, his uh, article, which the presentation will be on tonight. Um, <clears throat> briefly, I'll go over with you, uh, Judge Pryor. It's hard to be brief on a career like this. Uh, judge Pryor is a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the 11th Circuit. Uh, the 11th Circuit includes the states of Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. Uh, he was appointed by President uh, George W. Bush during a Senate recess uh, in 2004. Uh, his appointment was then confirmed by the U.S. Senate uh, in 2005. He served as Attorney General in here in the state of Alabama from 1997 to 2004. Uh, when first appointed, he was the youngest Attorney General in the nation. Quite an accomplishment. Uh, he was later elected and re-elected to that office in 1998 and 2002. In his re-election in 2002, uh, General Pryor received the highest percentage of votes of any statewide candidate. Uh, he is a graduate of a magna cum laude of the uh, Tulane University or Tulane Law School, where he was editor chief of the Tulane Law Review and member of the COIF, recipient of the George Dewey Nelson Memorial Award for the uh, graduate with the highest grade point average uh, in the common law curriculum, and a charter member and president of the Tulane Federalist Society. This was when. Uh, the Federalist Society was in its infancy, and it was not nearly as popular uh, as it is today. So he's been on the, with the program since its inception. Uh, after graduation, uh, Judge Pryor served as law clerk to Judge uh, Minor Wisdom uh, of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit uh, in uh, Louisiana. Uh, it was in New Orleans, is that where it was? Uh, after, following his judicial clerkship, he engaged in uh, private uh, practice litigation up in Birmingham for six years. He also serves as adjunct faculty uh, member and taught admiralty at the Cumberland School of Law at Samford University. Since 2006, he has uh, served each fall semester as a visiting professor of federal jurisdiction, which this uh, case is uh, Marbury versus Madison plays a prominent role in that curriculum at the University uh, of Alabama School of Law. He, Judge Pryor is a member of the Alabama Law Institute, the Board of Advisory Editors for the Tulane Law Review, and the Board of Advisory Editors for the Yale Law and, Pub Law and Public Policy Review. He is a life fellow of the Alabama Law Foundation. Uh, he is also a former chairman of the Federalism and Separation of Powers practice group of the Federalist Society. In 2002 and three, he also served as the state and local senior uh, advisory committee of the White House on Office on Homeland Security. Uh, he has lectured, he has, he's lectured and published widely uh, he has lectured at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library as well, as along with several other schools and universities. Uh, he's also testified before uh, committees of the United States Senate on capital punishment, environmental law, and the role of the, jud of the judiciary. He's a champion debater in college. He's also debated at national lawyers conventions at the Federalist Society, on national public radio, and at the Oxford Union in the United Kingdom. Uh, a simple Google will reveal uh, numerous uh, uh, speeches he's given uh, at the Mayflower Hotel, the uh, November, the, the Federalist Society has a national meeting, 
He's spoken uh, there as well, and a lot of his speeches uh, are on YouTube if you want to check that out after he speaks tonight. They're very interesting. Uh, Judge Pryor is married with two children. He married up and uh, married a Louisiana State University graduate, my alma mater. <clears throat> uh, and Judge Pryor is a, one of us. He is a Mobilian. So please join me in uh, welcoming Judge uh, William Pryor. <laughs> I did marry way above myself. Um, I did marry a Louisiana girl, as my father did before me. Uh, and then um, my older daughter went to the University of Alabama. I just got back from Miami with her. Matt. We had a good trip down there. And um, my younger daughter chose to go to LSU, where she wanted to study architecture. and. Um, all the in-laws in my family said, well, what are you gonna do with Victoria being at LSU and Caroline being at Alabama? And I said, um, that's all right. I said, Victoria doesn't care about football at all and they don't play it at LSU. <laughs> it's good to be home. <laughs> um, where's my clicker? <laughs> so as Matt mentioned, uh, for the last several years, I have taught federal jurisdiction. <coughs> this case book um, is the scourge of the existence of my students at the University of Alabama uh, School of Law, where I teach federal courts. And like many teachers of that subject, I begin by requiring my students to read and discuss Marbury versus Madison, the most famous case in the history of American law. There are many important lessons in that famous decision, but a lot of what Americans have been told during the last century about Marbury is wrong. Modern scholarship establishes that Marbury is a victim of historical revisionism. Marbury is occasionally described as the event where allegedly Americans invented judicial review. But that notion is so untrue as to be laughable. Marbury is routinely cited as supporting judicial supremacy, but it does nothing of the sort. Marbury is also celebrated as a triumph of judicial activism, but that proposition too is false. In fact, Marbury versus Madison is an example of judicial restraint. I agree with those who describe Marbury as our greatest case or the single most important decision in American constitutional law and in defining the role of the federal courts. But to understand Marbury, we must distinguish its real lessons from its irrepressible myths. Lawyers and judges especially should understand what makes Marbury great and why. To explain the real Marbury and why it is a great decision, I want to address three topics. First, I will provide an overview of the, the events that led to the decision many of which should be familiar to you. Second, I will describe the decision itself and its enduring lessons. And third, I will address the irrepressible myths about Marbury and how those myths were perpetrated. Now, the story of Marbury begins in 1800 with the election of President Thomas Jefferson and his supporters in Congress and the defeat of President John Adams and the Federalists. And although the defeat of Adams was pretty clear soon after the election. The victory of Thomas Jefferson was settled much later in Congress on the 36th ballot as a result of the tie of votes in the Electoral College between Jefferson and his running mate, Aaron Burr. That's what you get for running with Aaron Burr. <laughs> that mess led to the adoption of the 12th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, while Jefferson and Burr awaited the settling of their election, President Adams received a letter of resignation from Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth, who was ill in Paris, where he had negotiated a proposed treaty with France. Can you imagine the Chief Justice doing that today? Adams suddenly had the opportunity to nominate a new Chief Justice and have the lame duck Congress confirm the appointment before the Jeffersonians came to power in March 1801. The transition back then was a few months later. On December 18, 1800, Adams nominated John Jay, who had served as the first Chief Justice and was serving then as Governor of New York. 
but Governor Jay declined the appointment. Adams next decided to nominate his Secretary of State, John Marshall, to be Chief Justice. Marshall had served as an aide to General George Washington during the Revolutionary War, had established a successful practice in Richmond and a, a reputation as perhaps the leading lawyer in Virginia, and had played an important role in support of the adoption of the Constitution at the Ratification Convention in Virginia. George Washington once had offered to appoint Marshall as Attorney General, but Marshall had declined. Later, Marshall had served in Congress where he had been a floor leader for Adams in the House. In the infamous XYZ affair, Marshall also had served as one of three representatives of the United States to negotiate a treaty with France and had heroically refused to offer a bribe solicited by the French Foreign Minister, Charles Maurice Talleyrand. Marshall also was a second cousin once removed of Thomas Jefferson, and the two men detested each other. Now, in fairness, John Marshall could have thought a little worse of Jefferson. Marshall once joked in a letter, quote, the Democrats are divided into speculative theorists and absolute terrorists. With the latter, I'm not disposed to class Mr. Jefferson. So there you have it. <laughs> John Marshall did not consider his second cousin, the author of the Declaration of Independence and the third president, to be an absolute terrorist. <laughs> On January 27, 1801, the Senate unanimously confirmed John Marshall to be the third Chief Justice of the United States. That confirmation came one week after Adams's nomination of Marshall, who did not have to endure a hearing in the Senate. Those were the days. <laughs> On February 4, 1801, Justice William Cushing of Massachusetts administered the oath of office to the new Chief Justice who wore a plain black robe in keeping with the custom of Virginia, which set the standard that we follow today. Now, other justices that day wore the so-called party-colored robes that were then fashionable and may still be uh, in England. Although it would now be considered unthinkable, Marshall briefly served in two branches. He had, pre he had promised President Adams to continue serving as acting Secretary of State until Adams left office in March. The Supreme Court had only a few days of work in February to burden the new Chief Justice, but the Secretary of State had much work left for President Adams. Near the end of its lame duck session, the Federalist Congress enacted the Judiciary Act of 1801, which reduced the number of justices of the Supreme Court from six to five created a new system of circuit appellate courts and 16 new judgeships and eliminated circuit writing responsibilities for justices of the Supreme Court. Soon afterward, Congress also created several new justices of the peace. Adams busily worked to appoint Federalists to the new judgeships, the so-called midnight judges. As acting Secretary of State, John Marshall was responsible for the administration of the judicial appointments of Adams. Marshall received letters from the applicants, prepared the nomination papers, and affixed the great seal of the United States to the commissions that he was then responsible for delivering to the appointees. For that task, Marshall enlisted the assistance of his younger brother, James, whom Adams also had appointed to a new judgeship. Marshall finished his work in preparing the commissions, but a few of them were not delivered before Adams left office. One undelivered commission was for William Marbury to serve as a justice of the peace. Soon after Marshall administered to Jefferson the oath of office of, of the presidency, President Jefferson discovered Marbury's commission and others in the office of the Secretary of State. Now, Jefferson, of course, had served as our first Secretary of State. Jefferson, in his words, forbade the delivery of the commissions of Marbury and others. In Jefferson's view, the delivery was necessary to effectuate the appointment. And Jefferson, to say the least, was angry about Adams's appointment of the midnight judges. On December 17, 1801, former Attorney General Charles Lee, he'd been the Attorney General to John Adams, presented to the Supreme Court a petition for a writ of mandamus on behalf of William Marbury and three other men whose commissions as justices of the peace had not been delivered. Lee asked the court to issue a writ of mandamus to the new Secretary of State, James Madison, 
to deliver the commissions. Now, after Lee presented this petition, the new Attorney General, Levi Lincoln, declined to take any position on behalf of Secretary Madison. The Jefferson administration refused to show any respect for the Supreme Court in this matter. They were going to ignore the court. The next day, the Supreme Court announced that it would hear Marbury's petition in June 1802. The Jeffersonians soon moved to thwart the Federalist in the judiciary. On January 6, 1802, Jefferson's ally, Senator John Breckinridge of Kentucky, introduced a bill to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801. The Jeffersonians argued that the new judgeships created by the recent acts were unnecessary, and the Federalists, led by Senator Gouverneur Morris of New York, responded that the bill to abolish the judgeships was an unconstitutional assault on judicial independence. In March, Congress enacted the repeal of the Judiciary Act of 1801, and the Jeffersonians then went a step further by passing the Judiciary Act of 1802. Not only did the Jeffersonians return the justices of the Supreme Court to their earlier circuit riding, the Jeffersonians also canceled the June and December terms of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court would not be able to meet again to hear Marbury's petition until February 1803. Now these historical events, among others, explain why I am both amused and bewildered when leaders of the bench, like retired Associate Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and leaders of the, of the bar, <coughs> like the president of the American bar, need our water. <laughs> Excuse me. Like the president of the American Bar and the American Law Institute, suggests that the modern judiciary recently has been under some kind of unprecedented assault. The Marshall Court confronted a far more difficult challenge than anything the federal judiciary has encountered recently. The new laws enacted by Congress created a dilemma for the Supreme Court. Federalists wanted the court to declare the acts of Congress unconstitutional, but the justices, uh, and the justices to refuse uh, to ride circuit, but the justices disliked circuit riding, but they also concluded that if it was constitutional to return the justices, uh, for, for the justices to ha um, have circuit riding in 1801, then it was constitutional to return the justices to circuit riding responsibilities in 1802. Federalist lawyers later objected to the new composition of the circuit courts, and former Attorney General Charles Lee, in the case of Stewart versus Laird, and, um, objected to Chief Justice Marshall sitting on a circuit court as, a, as Chief Justice. Marshall overruled Lee's objection, and the final judgment was appealed to the Supreme Court. When the Supreme Court then finally convened in February 1803, Marbury versus Madison and Stewart versus Laird were both on the docket, and in both cases, former Attorney General Charles Lee represented the plaintiffs. In Marbury, Attorney General Levi Lincoln still refused to present an argument on behalf of the Jefferson administration, so the court was only going to hear from one side in that case. When the court on February 24th announced its judgment in Marbury, Chief Justice Marshall delivered a unanimous opinion. Before Marshall became Chief Justice, the justices typically had delivered separate opinions in each case. Marshall had changed that practice, and we still follow the custom he established, just as we do with the black robes. This practice infuriated Thomas Jefferson, especially when his appointees and those of his successor, James Madison, joined John Marshall's opinions. Chief Justice Marshall explained that the court would answer three questions in the order that former Attorney General Lee had presented them. First, has the applicant a right to the commission he demands? Second, if he has a right and that right has been violated, do the laws of this country afford him a remedy? Third, if they do afford him a remedy, is it a mandamus issuing from this court? Now, in answer to the first two questions in this politically charged case, Marshall grounded the opinion of the court and the rule of law. He wrote, the government of the United States has been emphatically termed 
a government of laws and not of men. Marshall explained as follows that liberty itself depended on the rule of law. The very essence of civil liberty certainly consists in the right of every individual to claim the protection of the laws whenever he receives an injury. I do not quarrel with the view of many scholars that this first section of Marshall's opinion grounded in the rule of law was intended, at least in part, to upbraid President Jefferson, whom Marshall regarded as lawless. But what Marshall wrote was timeless and right as a matter of first principles. Marshall explained that if the subject of the controversy was a discretionary act of the president, or in other words, a political decision, then the court could not interfere. Marshall wrote, by the Constitution of the United States, the president is invested with certain important political powers in the exercise of which he is to use his own discretion as, and is accountable only to his country in his political character and to his conscience. Political decisions, in Marshall's words, respect the nation, not individual rights, and being entrusted to the executive, the decision of the executive is conclusive. Now, this explanation that political questions are not justiciable, that is, the political decisions of the other branches are not reviewed by the judiciary, is the first important lesson of Marbury. Marshall next turned to the corollary rule. When the executive acts as an officer of the law, the judiciary can review his decision. Marshall stated that as an executive officer cannot, at his discretion, sport away the vested rights of others, which was surely a barb aimed at Thomas Jefferson. This proposition that every official, no matter how high or low, is accountable to the law is the second important lesson. This lesson means as well that the individual who considers himself injured has the right to resort to the laws of his country for a remedy. Now, several years ago, Louise Weinberg argued persuasively that this lesson was Marshall's main purpose and achievement in Marbury. There, she wrote, there can be little doubt that Marbury was intended first and foremost to establish judicial control over the government, over executive officials. Marshall explained that mandamus was the correct remedy to compel an officer to perform a legal duty. Marshall rejected the notion that the office alone <coughs> exempts the officer from being sued. Marbury's petition presented a case of a judicial nature, but the final question remained, could the Supreme Court issue the writ? Marshall concluded the opinion with an explanation of the constitutional duty of the judiciary. <coughs> that duty has two components. One is interpretive, the other is jurisdictional. Marbury, I mean, Marshall addressed both. Marshall explained that Article Three of the Constitution defines and limits the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is defined by the Constitution, and the appellate jurisdiction is regulated by Congress. That description is the third important lesson. Article Three makes all federal courts, both the Supreme Court and the inferior courts, courts of limited jurisdiction. Some critics of Marbury argue that John Marshall deliberately misinterpreted Article Three to confine the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to a narrow class of cases involving interstate disputes and cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls. They argue that Congress can somehow expand the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under the guise of creating an, an exception to the appellate jurisdiction of the court. They have speculated that John Marshall deliberately misinterpreted Article Three to create an opportunity to exercise the power of judicial review. I have never been persuaded by this argument. John Marshall's reading is the natural one of the text of the Constitution. It is also the reading that Alexander Hamilton provided in The Federalist and that John Marshall himself expressed as a delegate to the ratifying convention in Virginia long before this controversy ever arose. Those who argue that Marshall had an ulterior motive that corrupted his reading offer no evidence that their alternative reading was part of the original understanding. The problem, though, for the court was that Section 13 of the Judiciary Act of 1801, I mean, of, of 1789, the first Judiciary Act, purported to empower the court to issue a writ of mandamus in an original action against the Secretary of State or any federal official, even though Article 3 
Section 2 of the Constitution did not provide jurisdiction for Marbury's original action in the Supreme Court. Now here's the conflict. Section 13 stated, the Supreme Court shall have the power to issue writs of mandamus in cases warranted by the principles and usages of law to any courts appointed or persons holding office under the authority of the United States. That's the part they were relying upon. Article 3 states, in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. So it does not provide for the original jurisdiction for the, for the petition for writ of mandamus. Some scholars have suggested that a better reading of Section 13 was that it was intended to allow the court to issue a writ only in aid of its appellate jurisdiction or, or where the court already had original jurisdiction under Article 3. But without Attorney General Levi Lincoln to appear there for Secretary of Madison, the court never heard that argument. We do not even know whether Levi Lincoln held that view. The court instead responded to the only argument presented, and that argument by former Attorney General Lee was based on a literal reading of Section 13. Lee argued that the court itself had read Section 13 that way in a few cases before John Marshall became Chief Justice when other petitioners invoked the original jurisdiction of the court in unsuccessful attempts to obtain a writ of mandamus. Now James Fander argued in 2001 that the decision cited by Lee supported his reading of Section 13, but Louise Weinberg persuasively responded two years later that those earlier precedents, unlike Marbury, involved petitions for writs of mandamus that were actually within the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court provided by Article 3. But under either view, John Marshall did not misinterpret Section 13. In Marbury, the court explained that the conflict between Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution and Section 13 of the First Judiciary Act, as Lee read the statute, presented an unavoidable issue. Marshall wrote, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule in particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the court must decide on the operation of each. That portion of Marshall's opinion offers the fourth key lesson of the decision, that the judiciary is obliged to interpret the law that governs the case before it, and the Constitution is law. Marshall concluded by explaining why the court has the authority, indeed the duty, to obey the Constitution and dismiss the writ for lack of jurisdiction, even if Section 13 of the First Judiciary Act, as Lee read it, granted the court jurisdiction to issue the writ. Marshall explained the judicial power of the United States is extended to all cases arising under the Constitution. Marshall listed several provisions of the Constitution, the prohibition of bills of attainder and ex post facto laws, the requirement of two witnesses in the absence of a confession and a prosecution for treason, as peculiarly addressed to the judiciary. Marshall explained, it is apparent that the framers of the Constitution contemplated that <coughs> instrument as a rule for the government of courts as well as of the legislature. Now, note well that John Marshall invoked the framers' intent in interpreting the Constitution. I'll read back his, his sentence. It is apparent, this is from Marbury, that the framers of the Constitution contemplated that instrument as a, as a rule for the government of courts as well as of the legislature. He concluded by explaining that the judicial oath to support the Constitution meant that the court, like other branches, had to follow the Constitution and in this instance not exercise the jurisdiction that former Attorney General Lee had argued had been granted by, the, by Section 13 of the First Judiciary Act. Marshall's conclusion offers the final lesson of the decision that the Constitution is the law for all branches of the government. Now, a week after the court decided Marbury, the court announced its decision in Stewart versus Laird. Chief Justice Marshall did not participate in the decision because he had ruled on the question in the circuit court. But the court upheld the authority of Congress to restructure the inferior courts and return the justices to circuit writing. If any Federalist had hoped that the discussion about judicial review in Marbury foreshadowed a decision that the Judiciary Act of 1802 
violated the Constitution, their hope was dashed in an opinion that contained all of four paragraphs. It is hard to understand how Federalists could have had too high of hopes about Stewart versus Laird. The abolition of judgeships created by Congress was not at issue, as none of the appointees of President Adams were before the court seeking their reinstatement. The only issue was whether Congress could return the justices to circuit riding, and the justices had already made the decision to return to that duty. In any event, the Marshall Court <coughs> avoided a conflict with the Jeffersonians. Now that we've reviewed the real Marbury and its lessons, let us consider the three myths of Marbury. First, did the court in Marbury invent the practice of judicial review? Second, did the decision in Marbury establish the supremacy of the judiciary as the final arbiter of the meaning of the Constitution? Third, is the decision in Marbury an example of judicial activism? To each of these questions, the answer is no. The first myth is easily refuted. The decision in Marbury was not a magical moment when the su Supreme Court suddenly created judicial review. In recent decades, William Michael Traynor and Sylvia Snowis have published scholarship that establishes that there was an historical practice of judicial review in American courts before the decision in Marbury. Philip Hamburger has published an authoritative book entitled Law and Judicial Duty that explains in great detail how judicial review in early America was the application of the well-established duty at English common law to decide cases in accordance with the law of the land and to treat inferior law as void when it conflicts with superior law. Alexander Hamilton explained the duty of judicial review at great length in the Federalist Number 78, more than a decade before the Supreme Court decided Marbury. He wrote that whenever a particular statute contravenes the Constitution, it will be the duty of the judicial tribunals to adhere to the latter and disregard the former. Hamilton concluded, no legislative act, therefore, contrary to the Constitution, can be valid. At the Virginia Ratification Convention, as I mentioned earlier, John Marshall himself defended the authority of the judiciary to declare an act of Congress unconstitutional. In 1792, 11 years before Marbury, Five of the six justices of the Supreme Court, including the first Chief Justice, John Jay, riding circuit in Hayward's case, ruled that an act of Congress, the Invalid Pensions Act of 1792, which provided assistance to wounded veterans of the Revolutionary War, violated the Constitution insofar as it required the judiciary to provide advisory opinions to the Secretary of War about which veterans should be paid assistance. That decision was an exercise of judicial review. When the Supreme Court rendered its decision in Marbury, there was little, if any, reaction of displeasure that the court had declared Section 13 of the First Judiciary Act unconstitutional. There was not much controversy about the Marbury decision at all, which had avoided a conflict between the executive and the, and the judiciary. President Jefferson complained privately that Marshall should not have expressed an opinion about compelling an executive officer to perform a legal duty. And Jefferson repeated his view that an undelivered commission did not vest a legal right in the appointee. But Jefferson said nothing negative about the exercise of the power of judicial review. As David Ingdahl has explained, Jefferson himself highly praised Virginia's judges for having disregarded state legislation found to be at odds with their state constitution and his assumption that federal courts would perform likewise with respect to the federal constitution was advanced by him as a principal reason for adding a bill of rights by amendment. The discussion of the fundamental power of judicial review in Marbury was so unremarkable that the Marshall Court never cited Marbury versus Madison again for that proposition. Think about that. When the Tawny Court became the next to declare an act of Congress unconstitutional in the infamous decision Dred Scott versus Sanford, the court did not cite Marbury versus Madison. Robert Lowry Clinton has determined this practice continued during the period from 1865 through 1894. During these years, the court invalidated national laws in no fewer than 20 cases, yet Marbury versus Mad Madison is mentioned in none of them. The second myth, 
that Marbury established the judiciary as the supreme and final authority in determining the meaning of the Constitution is contrary to the language of the decision itself. When Marshall wrote that the particular phraseology of the Constitution of the United States confirms and strengthens the principle supposed to be essential to all written Constitution, that a law repugnant to the Constitution is void, he tied that statement to the conclusion, quote, that courts, as well as other departments, are bound by that instrument. Marshall described the Constitution as establishing, quote, a rule for the government of courts as well as of the legislature. Marshall's argument was for the supremacy of the Constitution, not the supremacy of the court. Marshall explained that the Constitution controls all the departments of government. He wrote, the original and supreme rule organizes the government and assigns to different departments their respective powers. It may either stop here or establish certain limits to not to be transcended by those departments. The government of the United States is of the latter description. Marshall did not say in any way that the judiciary was the ultimate arbiter of the meaning of the Constitution. Marshall interpreted a statute that governed the Supreme Court and decided that that statute was unconstitutional as applied to the Supreme Court and to Marbury's petition, which was outside the original jurisdiction provided by Article III. Marshall did not say anything negative about the duty of other branches to interpret the Constitution within their own spheres of responsibility. As, as David Ingdahl has explained, Marshall had long shared James Madison's view that judicial authority is specific and limited to specific cases. Now consider this language from the Marbury opinion following this famous quotation. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. That's the famous quote. But look at the rest of it. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. So that emphasis on cases continues in the opinion. So if a law be in opposition to the Constitution, if both the law and the Constitution apply to a particular case, so that the court must either decide that case conformably to the law disregarding the Constitution or, or conformably to, to the Constitution disregarding the law, the court must determine which of these conflicting rules governs the case. That is the very essence of judicial duty. Marshall's view was that the judiciary's determination of constitutional questions is limited in both opportunity and in authoritative impact to a particular case. The third myth, the final myth, that Marbury is an example of judicial activism is perhaps the strangest one of all when you consider the actual result of the decision. The Supreme Court dismissed Marbury's petition for, writ for lack of jurisdiction and refused to exercise its power to create a conflict with the executive branch. When the judiciary engages in judicial activism, it usurps the constitutional power of a political branch and fails to adhere to the constitutional text. Judicial activism is about wielding judicial power for political ends. In Marbury, the court obeyed the Constitution and exercised restraint by refusing to compel a political officer to act or refrain from acting. The Marbury court in no way frustrated popular will. The Marbury court grounded its decision in the text of Article Three, Section 2 of the Constitution and narrowly <coughs> construed its own power. The underlying intent of the Marbury opinion was to set forth a principled statement of the judiciary's place in the American constitutional dis system that disavowed any political role for courts and judges. John Marshall and the other Federalist justices achieved their narrow goals in Marbury and Stewart by distinguishing between the domain of law and the domain of politics. Now the myth that the Marbury court engaged in judicial activism is dependent on the premise that the Supreme Court deliberately misread either Section 13 of the Judiciary Act of 1789 or Article 3 or both so that the court could exercise the power of judicial review. But the premise is entirely flawed. The court sensibly interpreted Article 3 and correctly rejected former Attorney General Lee's reading of Section 13. The Marbury Court did not need to create a landmark precedent for judicial review, which was an already widely accepted practice. The more interesting questions are when, why, and how the Marbury myths were perpetrated. Robert Larry Clinton 
offer the answers to those questions in 1989 in his book, Marbury versus Madison and Judicial Review. Clinton explained that in 1894, the Supreme Court, for the first time, cited Marbury in support of an actual exercise of its power to invalidate acts of Congress and Farmer versus Pollock Loan and Trust Company, the famous income tax case. He attributed the creation of the Marbury straw man to what was then, get this, the conservative wing of the American Bar Association. <laughs> Back then, the laissez-faire wing of the American Bar championed a more expansive idea of judicial power than that which characterized earlier periods. Clinton explained, in the early 20th century, conservatives defended court supervision of legislation as essential for the protection of institutional property rights. On the liberal side, before 1937, historians and politicians were, quote, proving that judicial review was a usurpation of, the, of, of power defeating the original intent. Judicial review was the bane of progressives who supported legislative supremacy and economic regulation, and judicial review was the favored and effective tool of laissez-faire conservatives at the turn of the 20th century. Between 1897 and 1937, almost as many state laws were invalidated on 14th Amendment grounds alone as had been struck down in toto during the previous 110 years. Once the rights of blacks had been read out of the 14th Amendment in Plessy versus Ferguson, the court's primary target became statutes regulating various forms of business activity. During that 40-year period, the court struck down some 209 state laws on 14th Amendment grounds. As to federal laws, the court overturned some 55 acts of Congress between 1896 and 1936, nearly tripling the previous number. But then came the New Deal. President Franklin Roosevelt's legislative program not only changed the size and scope of the federal government, the New Deal also reversed political perspectives about the judicial role. After 1937, the positions began to shift, and by the 1960s, liberals had begun to argue that judicial review was necessary, either for protecting or countering the democratic process. Conservatives, on the other hand, argued that judicial review was just plain undemocratic. During the first half of the 20th century, a few historians created a scholarly foundation for the Marbury myth. Now, they're, they're, they're criticizing Marbury at the time. Edward Corwin, a progressive who taught at Princeton, published a series of writings about judicial review between 1910 and 1920 that laid the foundation for the conventional narrative. Albert Beveridge, a, a biographer of John Marshall, contributed to that narrative during the same period, and William Winslow Krosky's, whose photograph I cannot find, if you know of one, let me know, I can add it to my slideshow. A constitutional historian and professor of law at the University of Chicago later endorsed Corwin's progressivist critique as part of his attack on the early New Deal court. These scholars, although great in many respects, perpetrated the Marbury myth to support a critique of the modern exercise of judicial review. They were against what the conservatives wanted in the judiciary in striking down economic legislation. They were for legislative supremacy and were attacking Marbury, which had been upheld by the conservative wing of the American bar. So the completion of the Marbury myth occurred during the tenure of Chief Justice Earl Warren and, cont uh, and continued during the tenure of Chief Justice Warren Burger. As Clinton studies this establishes, the court adopted the theory of its own supremacy and constitutional interpretation in 1958 and grounded that adoption in Marbury versus Madison. Mar Clinton's statistics about citations of Marbury by the Supreme Court after 1958 tell the story about the acceptance of the myth. There are 89 separate citations of Marbury from 1958 to 1983, which almost equals the total of the previous 154 years. Of these 89, 50 utilize Marbury in support of some kind of judicial review. Of these 50, at least 18 read Marbury as having justified sweeping assertions of judicial authority. Of these 18, nine apply at Marbury to support the idea that the court is the final or, or ultimate interpreter of the Constitution with power to issue binding proclamations to any other agency or department of government respecting any constitutional issue. 
after the Warren Court adopted Marbury as a precedent for judicial supremacy, the fans of the Supreme Court in the law schools put a positive spin on the Marbury myth. Now, Professor Alexander Bickle of Yale wrote in 1962, if any social process can be said to have been done at a given time and by a given act, it is Marshall's achievement. The time was 1803, and the, decision, and, and the act was the decision in the cast of Marbury versus Madison. In 1969, Professor William Van Alstyne of Duke wrote that of all Marshall's significant contributions to our constitutional history, none has been more acclaimed or seems more secure as enduring precedent than his decision in Marbury versus Madison. The Marbury myth had come full circle from the tool of the critics of the Supreme Court to the event celebrated by proponents of judicial supremacy. Now, Chief Justice Marshall de deserves neither credit nor blame for the modern view of judicial supremacy. Popular mythology dishonors the straightforward man by depicting him as a master of subtle statecraft. He was not a result-oriented judge. The argument he stated in favor of a modest exercise of judicial review in Marbury was neither novel nor controversial. Marbury is not a precedent for judicial activism. Marbury is a victim of historical revisionism by both proponents and critics of the decisions of the Supreme Court in the second century of this country. The, the moral of the, the history of Marbury is clear. For those who want to distort the principles of our constitutionalism, it is often helpful to revise the history of its practice. For those who want to restore the principles of our constitutionalism, it is always necessary to know the truth of the history of its practice. We should still teach and celebrate Marbury versus Madison, but we should do so for the right reason, for its exposition of the limited and essential role of the federal judiciary under the Constitution. Thank you. Smoke, right? real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think would have happened if uh, Levi Lincoln uh, actually showed up and issued a subpoena and had it served on the Chief Justice as a material witness in the case? That's a great question. You know, I don't know what, what that happened. That would, would have removed him probably create a conflict, but it would have been politically embarrassing to explain why his malfeasance uh, resulted in this uh, situation in the first You know, it, it offends all our modern sensibilities that... John Marshall, having overseen um, the, the appointments, the paperwork, really, for these judicial appointments, is there presiding in the case and deciding the case. But guess what? There's no criticism at the time of that. And it's not like it was a secret. It was widely known. Now, I don't know. So let's say Levi Lincoln subpoenas John Marshall, right? What's he going to testify to? It's not like he really has um, any knowledge of anything that's presented um, in the question before the court. It, 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 the the, the uh, commission hasn't been delivered. <laughs> the Jefferson administration hasn't delivered it. And Marshall's not there when they decide not to deliver it. Okay? He, he can testify to something that's undisputed, and that is Adams signed the commission and, the, and that the commission was sealed. Um, and then it's essentially undisputed, too, that the commission um, does not get um, delivered. But it's, it's hard to know how he would have really been much of a material witness. It, it might, have, might it have been embarrassing? I don't know. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, at the time, everybody knows that Marshall had that role, and no one's criticized him for participating in the case. There, there, so, was, no, there, there was no record initially, so they had to put on some testimony. That's right. And I read that they actually, the judge, Marshall, had considered and ruled upon an affidavit of his own brother. Right, that's right. And, and, and well, and, and, and they, 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 there was some um, calling of Levi Lincoln for purposes of, of, of establishing that, rink, that record, but not as in, in terms of presenting any argument for the court. It's just, I guess, today we call it unique. So. Yeah. I mean, one of the questions that was asked to me, I gave this speech at noon um, at a law school, and uh, one of the students asked, what, what would have happened had the court ruled the other way? 
Would Jefferson have obeyed the decision? Most scholars think no, he would not have. Uh, and that would have been a, a big showdown. There are some modern scholars, though, who have, are really starting to question that. They're not so sure that Jefferson would not have um, obeyed. He obeyed in the, the Burr case, but when they said that, that, that's, okay. that's part of the reason why they yeah. made that argument. Um, uh, what I have, though, argued is that regardless of that, I do think Marbury had a role in protecting the court. The court is under siege at this moment in our history. It's 18, I mean, 1801, two, three, they've canceled terms of the court. They've repealed these acts. The, I mean, the act that created the new uh, appellate judgeships was a really widely accepted view of court reforms that were needed at the time and that eventually do take place decades later. Ending circuit writing responsibility was something that most uh, lawyers at the time thought was probably uh, a good idea. But there was always a debate about, well, if we end circuit writing responsibilities for justices of the Supreme Court and they don't have to go out and charge grand juries and, and see the people and, and engage in trials, then they'll just be trapped in an ivy tower <laughs> in the capital city. Now, I don't know where anyone could have gotten that idea about the Supreme Court, but that was the argument in the, um, in the 19th century. Um, but, but, you know, this wasn't a lot, that bill wasn't so much a partisan bill, except for it gave Madison, I mean Adams, the opportunity to appoint all those new uh, judges. judges. But, but the content of the, of the new law itself had been kind of widely accepted as, um, as needed reforms. Um, so, but I think that at the end of the day, by ref not creating a conflict with the Jeffersonians, uh, the court really survived this period of our history. Uh, you can never know what would have happened had the case gone the other way, but I, we do know this. Uh, one of the things that also happens in this period is that the Jeffersonians impeach a Federalist judge. John Pickering, who was a drunk and a real scoundrel uh, and deserved to be impeached, was impeached. Uh, but then articles of impeachment were brought against Justice Samuel Chase. And now Justice Chase, in charging grand juries back when they were doing their circuit riding, he was a partisan Federalist, and he would give his opinions as a Federalist on the topics of the day to these grand jurors. And, uh, and that was controversial with the Jeffersonians, uh, and, and that was the subject of the bill of impeachment brought against him. House impeached him. Of course, the Senate refused to convict him narrowly, and, uh, and he survived the day. The question I've, I've posed is, would he have survived that impeachment trial had Marbury come out the other way? I'm not as sure of that, uh, but, but, but he did survive, and as a result, federal judges since then have, have been thought that it's best to stay out of partisanship and politics, and, and, and the other branches have also seen that it's, it's not really appropriate to impeach federal judges for their judicial decision. So that's the truce as a result of the, um, of the Chase impeachment trial. Now, I think you had a question. Uh, those who say that, uh, that Marshall got very political, mm -hmm. that, that it was all a very clever political ruse, right. uh, say that in part because he seemed in some ways to consider the questions in the wrong order. Right. That uh, the very first question that uh, the court needs to determine is the question of, or the dual questions of jurisdiction and standing. Right. And that instead of ruling first that the court did not have the proper jurisdiction right. and therefore not getting to the other matters, right. he got to the more political first and then say that. That's right. And that was really kind of Jefferson's view too. Um, so I um, say it's entirely wrong. <laughs> uh, and it's wrong for, for a couple of reasons. The first kind of more practical historical reason is the custom of the day was the court would answer questions 
in the order that counsel had presented them, and this was precisely the order in which attorney, former Attorney General Charles Lee had presented his case, and so they're responding to the argument as he made. And that, that was typical of the period. But there's another thing, and I think this is the most important part. Marbury versus Madison is a jurisdictional opinion from beginning to end. The first question that Marshall addresses is, is what we're being asked to review here, the refusal to deliver the commissions, is that a political decision or is that a legal decision? If it's a political decision, we can't review it. Now that is regarded today as the foundation for something we call the political question doctrine. It's one of the first things I teach in federal jurisdiction. That's a jurisdictional question. He's saying, if it's political, we have no jurisdiction. So he is starting off with jurisdiction. Then he next turns to the question, well, is this is an action for mandamus? What is he answering there? He's looking at the statute, section 13 of the Judiciary Act, that Attorney General Lee is arguing provides the court jurisdiction, and he's trying to make sure that this action comes within the terms of the statute. So he's interpreting what is being argued as a jurisdictional statute and making sure it comes within the terms. That is a jurisdictional question. He, he, one of the questions he asks along the way is, one well, of the answers really is he says, the office alone does not exempt the officer from being sued. Remember I read that quote from the opinion, early in the, in the opinion. What's that? That's a question about official immunity, which is a judicial, I mean, a, a jurisdictional question. He's saying the fact that the Secretary of State holds the office of Secretary of State does not exempt him from being sued or compelled by the court to do something, to deliver the commissions. That's a jurisdictional question. What he saves for last is not the jurisdictional question. What he saves for last is the constitutional question. Whether, after he answers all those questions and says, yeah, you know what? This isn't a political question. Secretary of State can be sued. This is mandamus. This comes within the letter of the statute. But we've got this problem. Is Section 13 constitutional? Does it come within Article 3 of the Constitution? He saves that constitutional question for last. That is judicial restraint. That's what federal courts are supposed to do. You're not supposed to answer constitutional questions unnecessarily. You're supposed to avoid constitutional questions. You're supposed to, if you can dispose of the case on a non-constitutional ground, you, you do it. You avoid the constitutional even if, question. Even if the constitutional question is a constitutional question about jurisdiction. Absolutely. But, but all the other questions are jurisdictional too. Just That's not quite as obvious. No, well, I mean, not as obviously because they're not phrased as jurisdictional, but, but every one of these lessons, this is the reason Barbary is at the very front of most federal courts' uh, case books is because it offers so many lessons in jurisdiction, uh, things that we now understand as jurisdictional um, uh, questions. So uh, what, what he saves for last, he should have saved for last. He saved the constitutional question for last, and that's what we, uh, that's what we want uh, courts to do. Uh, this decision affect the Louisiana Purchase. Wasn't that about the same time? It is not uh, it's about the same time, but it really doesn't have had nothing, it, to, do it, had nothing to do with it. it, it Louisiana Purchase shows that um, Thomas Jefferson was a much better president than he was a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know I've bored you long enough now. So, uh, Quinn, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, Quinn and I've talked about this before. I, 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 I planted the question, and uh, I, I, I was asked that question. The one law school where I've gotten that question asked was at Harvard Law School, and the student who asked it is now one of my law clerks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, evaluation forms if you want the credit. Uh, help yourself to drinks in the back and we have plenty of food left. So.